it seems like an age ago that I last talked about how to play with Hunters of Wanchi. They have been out for about a year now, and my original video has racked up thousands of views and people seem to be happy with it. But I wanted to do an update to that video for you today. We're going to be re-looking at the faction as a whole. We're going to be looking at it in the lens of Warcry a year on from when they were first released. And really, as our understanding of the game has continued and our understanding of the missions and what makes a good fighter, what doesn't make a good fighter and how we want to play that, I think that enough has changed to warrant me going back and taking a look at the faction. I've gone to a whole bunch of events. You can see them if you want to check them out on my channel. I've got list reviews. I've got event reviews for that. Yeah, I've taken them a lot. I've I've, I've won a couple. Um, so basically I put in the reps so that you don't have to. And yeah, now is my chance to really enhance everything that I have learned over the last year to you guys so that you can be successful yourselves. Before we get into that, if you like what you see, as always, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want to throw some support my way, you can check that out on YouTube. You can become a member. You can check out my Patreon if you want to see exclusive behind the scenes content. If you want to see advanced showings of the videos I've got coming up next or if you want to say into the kinds of videos I'm producing you can check that out or alternatively if none of that is for you you can check out Streamlabs and throw some support that way. But yeah that's it without further ado let's get back into the Narwood back into the Hunters of Huanchi. Okay, as last time, we're going to start with the reaction. The reaction is called Slippery. A fighter can make this reaction after they've been allocated damage points by a melee attack action. And this fighter is going to make a bonus disengage. So if we take a look at our little scenario that we've got here, we've got our Jade Obelisk. He's going to move in. He's going to attack. He's going to do seven points of damage. Not enough to kill our Skink. The Skink is going to react with Slippery and then react. Overall, this is probably, in my experience, one of the strongest reactions in the game. Why is it strong? Because if you start in combat with an enemy fighter and they attack you but do not kill you, you can react to run away and it effectively wastes that fighter's second attack action because they will not be able to attack you again unless they get back into melee range, whether it be one inch, two inches or whatever. And what that also has the effect of doing is it really pushes the life of your skinks out. So let's say we're talking about Hawanshi's claw, it has 10 wounds. Normally an attack attack action would be able to kill it. But in this way, what you're doing is you're taking the first attack, running away, the second action isn't even hitting you. So in effect, the skink doesn't die that turn unless your opponent wants to spend even more resource into pushing more fighters into that skink to try and take them out. So it both protects your fighters and wastes actions and activations from your opponent. And that's really what makes it very, very strong. We are going to start this by talking about the Chameleon Skink Dart Pipes. They're bad. We all know they're bad. The question is, why are they bad? And really it's because of that damage profile combined with the amount of points that you're actually paying for those Skinks. Your basic Skink is going to be sitting around about 70 points, maybe 75, maybe a little bit more, depending on which flavor that you go for. And the real problem is that they got movement six. So you're already paying that tax for the movement six and the very low damage from your dart pipes don't go anywhere near far enough to make up for the high points cost that you're paying. You can see here it's got a range of six, a 2112 damage profile, which is basically the worst damage profile in the game. It's got an average damage of 1.22. I've used DPA five here. So the damage that you will be doing when wounding on fives, reason for that, it's strength one, so it's always going to be wounding everything in the game on fives. You can't boost the amount of attacks that it gets using Onslaught. Um, you have Envenomed Weapons, which you can use that we're going to be taking a look at in a little bit. But even using Envenomed Weapons, it only pushes up that damage by about one point. So you're going to be doing two points of damage off of an entire attack action, which is just not that good. And on top of that, if you are using the Dart Pipe, you don't gain any additional abilities from your rune marks. So other fighters will have other rune marks because they are equipped with different things. And you're going to be getting none of that. It's basically your Skink. You put him on the board and you've got your dart pipe. If chameleon skinks were closer to 60 points, then I would say yes, there's definitely a world in which I could see myself bringing far cheaper skinks with dart pipes to make up for the low damage. Um, but as they are right now, they're not really something that you want to bring. 
Going on into the leaders, we've got the Skink Alpha here. The Alpha comes in two flavors. We've got the Skink Alpha with Dark Pipe and the Skink Alpha with Moonstone Club. The Dark Pipe we've already gone over. It's very rare, extremely unlikely, in fact, that you're going to ever be using it. So we're going to look at the club itself. The Skinks themselves, they all have a bunch of different abilities in common. The first ability here is Agile Climbers. It's on a double. Until the end of this fighter's activation, you do not count the vertical distance moved when this fighter is climbing. I found this very useful more often than not. The skinks themselves do have movement six, so you can combine that with agile climbers. You can do a move move for 12 inches, and they can basically get up or over any kinds of pieces of terrain. Because you are never going to be counting the vertical distance, even if the terrain is very, very tall, it could be five or it could be six inches tall, you're never going to count that and you can always just leap up there and do whatever it is you're going to do. So Agile Climbers, very good. The second double that they all have access to is Envenomed Weapons. We're going to be adding one to the damage points allocated by each hit and critical hit from the next attack action made by this fighter in this activation. So if we look at the damage here, the average damage of our Moonstone Stone Club is going to be 2.83. You're only strength 3, so you're not really going to be wounding most things easily. You're going to be wounding most things on 5s. But if you use Venom Weapons, that boosts that damage up to 4.33, which actually isn't all that bad. It has just enough oomph maybe to finish off enemy chaff units. So it's, it's not terrible, but most of the time you're probably going to be using your Agile Climbers instead. Envenom Weapons is better than Onslaught if you only have one attack. However, if you do have two attacks to make, use your Onslaught and you will overall net more damage with your basic damage plus the additional attacks. The Alpha with Moonstone Club, just by having the club, it gives it access to the hurled bolus triple any one of your skinks with clubs will have access to this and what we're going to be doing is picking a visible enemy fighter within eight inches you're going to roll a number of dice equal to the value of the ability so higher triples will net you higher amounts of dice to roll and if one of those dice scores a six it makes one fewer action this battle round to a minimum of zero if a fighter is reduced to zero actions in this way it can't be activated this battle round now this ability itself, it says if one of those dice is a six and not for each dice that is a six. So even if you roll multiple sixes, you're only going to be reducing the amount of actions that that fighter can do by one. Um, that being said, if you have a high enough triple, it's actually an extremely useful ability to have at least one of in your warband. And you probably will have one because you're going to be bringing the alpha with club anyway. The reason for that is because it's got such a large range, you can walk up to an enemy fighter. Let's say it might be a Formoid Crusher, it might be a Varangard, it might be an Orc War Boss, whatever it is, your opponent's biggest piece on the board. You can throw your Hurled Bolas, and as long as your triple is high enough, get that six, reduce his actions by one, and then suddenly, instead of move attacking, it's just moving. So it's very strong. It's one of the strongest control abilities that order actually have access to but because it needs a big triple it's actually fairly unreliable i've got its chance to hit here if we're looking at triple one 17 percent 31 percent on a triple two 42 percent on triple three going all the way up if you roll a triple six it's got a 67 percent chance of hitting so basically we're looking at a three or more to hit if you've got that triple six those odds are way better uh, than most other nets in the game. So if you have the dice to spend, I think Hell Bolus is actually fairly good. Finally, we've got the Hunters of Huanchi quad hit and run. The fighter will make a bonus move action or bonus disengage action. Then it will make a bonus attack action or bonus move action. We're always going to compare this to Rampage, but considering that the Hunters of Huanchi aren't really known here for the amount of damage that they can put out, I think this quad is better. It's far more versatile, and I've used it to really good effect. Like I've said, Hunters of Huanchi, six inch move across basically your entire warband. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to effectively move up to 24 inches in and around the battlefield, which is massive. You can run from one side of a board to another. If you need to go and get treasure on the other side of the board, you can do that. If you need to go and get an objective on the other side of the board, you can do that also. If you need to get out of the way, you've got a fighter that's about to die. Maybe you're playing Reaper. You're going to con concede points to your opponent. You can use the quad, get your free disengage, get your bonus move, and then use your move move to really just get out of there and put yourself way out of harm's way. So overall, I like the quad. 
Yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's a niche ability. But when you need to use it, you'll be very glad that you've actually got it there. Let's look at the skinks themselves. Uh, effectively, we've got two different kinds of skink. We've got the skink hornblower and the normal chameleon skink. Uh, the hornblower is 70 points, or you can pay 75 points to have the blowpipe going with it. The, the real difference is that the dart pipe, as we've seen, 2212 damage profile, pretty bad. Range 6, it's okay. Or the Moonstone Club has that 3313 damage profile, which is better. Toughness 3, if we're talking about normal chameleon skinks, they keep the toughness 2 if we're talking about hornblowers with Moonstone Clubs. And the one thing that I do want to bring your attention to is that if you are a hornblower and you are taking the club, you do not have the additional rune mark for the Hurled Bolas triple, which is pretty bad. That's why I think that the hornblower itself is probably the only candidate in the warband for a skink that you want to be taking the dart pipe on simply because it doesn't get any additional bonuses for having that moonstone club the hornblower itself does have its own unique triple call of the hunt we're going to be picking a friendly fighter with a hunts of wanchi and beast rune marked the nine ninjas of this fighter so that fighter is basically going to be the terror wing that we're going to be taking a look at in a moment that fighter gets to make a bonus move action then you pick a visible enemy fighter within one inch of the fighter that you moved and then you allocate a number of damage points to that fighter equal to the value of this ability. So bigger triples are better in this case. As we know, we're just going to do more damage. And it gives that Terror Wing a bonus move action. Now Terror Wings are fine. We'll check them out. They are decidedly okay. That extra move action and the extra attacks that they're going to be doing isn't going to amount to a loss of damage. But if you are running out of the box, Hunters of One Chief, for example, I can see you wanting to bring one or maybe even two Hornblowers so you're able to spread that ability out onto the battlefield and then use your three Terror Rings to move about and then effectively tie up enemy units and really use them for disruption as opposed to the actual amount of damage that they're going to do. Secondly here, we've got your normal Chameleon Skinks. You've got Dark Pipe, you've got the Moonstone Club. If you're taking normal Chameleon Skinks, you'll always want to bring the club. They got the Toughness 3, they got a better stat line, and they got Hell Bolus. So that's basically what you're going to be taking 99% of the time. Talking about the Terror Wings, here they are, 90 points, movement 10, which is good, toughness 3, which is fine for this warband. They only have 8 wounds, so they are on the squishy side. One thing that I do want to mention is that they do not have the Scout rune mark, which comes with Hunters of Wanchi, and all of their basic abilities tie into that Scout rune mark. So they're not able to use Slippery, not able to use Agile Climbers, even though they don't need to use it because they have Fly, and they are not able to use Envenom weapons. The Terror Wing itself has a 3 3 1 3 damage profile, which is, like I said, it's okay. It's not going to be winning any awards. However, they are 90 points, so I feel like they're cheap enough when combined with your Hornblowers to be able to use them as a more disruption style piece as opposed to a, oh, I'm going to run in and I'm going to do damage piece. So what you want to be doing, tying up your opponent's support characters, tying up your opponent's support pieces. So for example, if you're playing against Karajan Overlords, using the triple to get a free move on the Terror Wing, having it run into their guns, it does have 10 inch moves, so it will be able to get there and making sure that those guns can't shoot at you for that turn or are reducing the amount of attack actions they can use on the rest of your warband down to one because they are engaged with the Terror Wings. I think that's very valuable. There's a question as to whether you actually want to use Terror Wings being fast disruption pieces in essentially an entire warband of fast disruption pieces. My feeling is that once you get outside of the realms of one box warbands and you go to make hunters your own thing, introduce allies, introduce other things into them, I think you'll be, you'll be wanting to drop the Terror Wings for other things. But straight out of the box, they're not terrible, just bear in mind they're not going to do all the damage that you want them to do. Next up, we have Wanchi's Claw, the single best fighter in the warband. If I could take these as my leaders, I would take them as my leaders also. They're really good. For 75 points, what do we get? 8-inch range, which is automatically 2 inches better than your dart pipes. Still two shots, but strength three. So now it gets to wound toughness three things on fours, which is huge with a one four damage profile. So you're able to do that spike damage if you do manage to get those attacks in. The Conchi's Claw itself has movement six, just like all the rest of the skinks. It's got toughness three and it's got 10 wounds. So that toughness three combined with the 10 wounds suddenly makes it a very difficult prospect to kill when we take into account the slippery reaction. Most fighters in the game were 
they'll easily be able to half shot an eight wound chaff model, but it makes it much more difficult to half shot a 10 wound chaff model, and especially one that you need to effectively kill in one go, because otherwise it's just going to run away. Uh, there are very few fighters that are, are able to, with one attack action, one shot of one cheese claw, so that really does stretch out their survivability and gives you a lot of additional options into how to use them in your actual games. They do have their own triple Bellow of the Carnosaur, which is again a very good disruption piece. We're going to be picking an enemy fighter within six inches until the end of the battle round. We're going to subtract one from the move characteristic of that fighter to a minimum one, and subtract one from the damage profiles from each hit and critical hit actions made by that fighter, again to a minimum of one. When we're looking at some of the slower, big, chunky leaders that people like to bring, so stuff like the Orc Megaboss, for example, it's only movement three, you can battle with the Carnosaur it, it goes down to movement two, and then it's not getting anywhere fast. Again, there are a large number of fighters with a 2-4 damage profile, which is generally pretty good, and it will start to chew through your skinks if you give them enough time. You can bellow them, put them down to a 1-3 damage profile, and suddenly they're crit fishing and not doing all that much. So it's another good control piece in a warband full of good control pieces. Whether you're going to be using this or whether you're going to be using Hulk Bonus will really depend on the value of the triple that you rolled. Hulk Bonus, like I said, is much better on big triples, but if you roll something like a triple one, Bell of the Carnosaur, it'll do the job for you. Now, I've just told you that they are the best fighter in the warband, so how are we getting all these Wanshee's Claws? taking into consideration that in the box, you only get one. For that, what I've done is I've used the Blood Bowl Lizardman team. If you look into that box, you get two sprues of Lizardman. In those, on those sprues, you get three Skink headdresses. I've circled them here. Then you can use Age of Sigma Skink Javelins, along with your Chameleon Skinks with shields that you're gonna get in the box anyway. And you can make a bunch more once she's claw and you'll be able to use those in your game. So that's something that I definitely recommend. If you are thinking about playing Quantas of Wanshi in any kind of competitive manner, you'll be wanting to maximize on those claws. You'll be wanting to bring, build five or even six of them. And this is a very economical way to actually be able to do that. Looking into allies, there are effectively two routes you can take. You can either go down the support route to try and make your existing fighters better, or you can go down the damage route and shore up the inherent weaknesses that there are in the warband. The warband itself, what is it? It's very fast, but it's very fragile. That means that it makes it very good at objective missions, very good at treasure missions, but really, really bad at kill missions. So when we're looking at allies, depending on your build, uh, you'll be basically be going down one of those two routes. Uh, I've got a couple of support allies here. We've got Kalthia Zandaya and the Aether Chemist. The Aether Chemist can basically be any fight for profit dwarf character, but looking at Kalthia Zandaya first, what has she got? She's got her coordinated strike triple. We're going to pick a number of visible fighters equal to half the value of the ability. So if you roll a triple five or a triple six, you can pick up to three friendly visible fighters within nine inches. So it's a very long range. Those fighters can make bonus move or bonus attack actions, and you can choose between your fighters which kinds of actions that you want to make. Considering that Hunters of Wanshi are already extremely fast and extremely maneuverable, making them even more so really pushes your ability to play objective missions and to play treasure missions way and above what most other warbands would be able to do. So if you're looking in a tournament setting, for example, you really need to look at the types of missions that you're expecting to play. And if you're going to be sitting on the treasure or on the objective side of things, Kalthia Zandaya with that triple will be very good for you. She'll be able to move your fighters in and then they can use their six inch move to move around and move out if they have the piece of treasure. As a fighter herself, she isn't bad, 210 points, 5424 damage profile, which is very nice. Movement five, so she can kind of keep up with your skinks in this case. Toughness five, a little bit more tanky and 25 wounds. If we're looking at divine blessings, I like to throw an extra basic point of damage onto her to make her a 5434, four, makes her extremely consistent and turns her into a kind of 
semi-mobile damage threat that you can throw into most things and generally expect her to do pretty well. So that's why I like Kalthia. She's basically my favorite order ally at this point. Um, secondly, I talked about the Aether Chemist or any Fight for Profit character really, but the Aether Chemist just happens to be my particular favorite. And it's got the Fight for Profit triple, which is going to be giving plus one attack to all friendly fighters within three inches. And then on top of that, if the Aether Chemist is carrying treasure or is near an objective mission, again, pushing into that route of being very good at objectives, they're going to get plus two attacks. Now, your blowpipes aren't that good. Your javelins are better off of your Huanchi's claw. But if you can suddenly make them four attacks, they become four, three, one, four for each javelin. And then those javelins attacking twice are attacking with eight hits. A bunch of those will crit and you're going to start doing a lot of damage. So the Aether Chemist effectively makes your poor range damage actually quite usable. The biggest comparison here would probably be to Wilder Corpse Hunter's Trailblazers with crossbows. They have four attacks apiece. The Aether Chemist makes your Wanchi's Claws into those Trailblazers at a discounted rate with a higher crit damage. So that's why Aether Chemist and Fight for Profit is very good. The reason specifically why I like the Aether Chemist is for that ranged attack. I mean, just check it out. Six inch range, six dice, a strength four, so it's going to be winning most things on fours or threes with one three damage profile. Damage profile you don't really need to worry about, but when it's sitting on an objective and it pops fight for profit, going up to eight attacks, shooting twice, 16 attacks at strength four with a one three damage profile, that's potentially huge. It can melt through most chaff units. It can really put a massive dent in most of those bespoke 20 wound leaders that we see at or around the 200 point mark. If we're talking about divine blessings, I like to throw the blessing of strength onto his ranged attack, make him strength five, then he goes to wounding most things on threes, which really makes that damage stick. Talking about damaging fighters, so the other side of things, I've got here a couple of options for you. We got Neve Black Talon, a relatively new addition with the release of the Black Talons box set. She's 285 points, but look at her stat line, 6524. That is absolutely great. She does have that range attack if you need to use it, but more than often you won't. She's very fast at movement seven, toughness five, like all Stormcast, and 30 wounds. So you point her at a thing and she will blend her way through it. If we're talking about Divine Blessings, again, give her that base point of damage, make her a six, five, three, four, and she will cut through most things in the game very happily. Alternatively, I've had a lot of success with the Achillean King. There are two flavors of King. It's got the bladed polearm or the sword. I like the polearm. The two inch range is a little bit better. The strength five is a little bit better considering most of the things that you will be fighting are going to be toughness four. Two five damage profile isn't bad. It's got movement 10, which makes it extremely fast. Toughness force was a little bit more fragile, but it's got 35 wounds to make up for that. The Kellyan King itself has a bonus move double on the first turn, which is very good. It's also got storm of blows, which gives it plus three attacks. So you'll be able to move in with your movement 10 pop storm of blows, attack with seven attacks, and again, very much like Neve, blend your way through most things. Now, finally, I've got here Pox. Shot, 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 shot. This is something relatively recent I've been playing with to very good effect. Pock is just fantastic. That range attack, 15 inch range, two, four, three, six damage profile. It doesn't look great, but once you start putting the blessing of strength onto Pock to make him strength five, suddenly he's wounding most things on threes. So those four attacks that he's going to be getting out of those two attack actions will be enough to knock out fight return, which is really important for something like Hunts of Wanchi. You want to be keeping that activation advantage so that you get to dictate the flow of the game as opposed to your opponents. On top of that pop herself has her explosive bolts double where she will be doing half the value of the ability to enemy fighters within three inches of your target if she scores a hit very important here that we mentioned that it's specifically on a hit not on a hit and crit those two things are categorized differently in your games of Warcry. but yeah as long as you hit you'll be able to do up to three damage. Uh, a nice thing you can do with Pock is use your first shot, shoot a fighter, use your second shot, shoot another fighter next to it, use explosive bolts, and hopefully use the splash damage from that ability to kill the first fighter that you were attacking. So very good. Pock does come with a kind of, but not really tax to go with her in the form of Haskell Hexbane. Hexbane's decent, he's 125 points, 
He's got 20 wounds. He's got toughness 4, which is really good. His ranged attack is also pretty decent. He's got the gun, which is a 3 4 1 3 damage profile. Again, that's better than most of your skinks. And on top of that, he actually has the ability to fight in combat to a certain degree. So. I think Haskell is a decent upgrade to some of your skinks. He's not exactly super expensive, but really the utility and the ability to take down targets is kind of what makes the Pock and Haskell combo uh, so strong. Finally, I've had a lot of success using the Starblood Stalkers. One of the big problems with the Hunts of Fuanchi is that they are very expensive for the points cost that you're paying, but the Starblood Stalkers themselves, they effectively haven't had any points updates in this edition, so they are still sitting at the old points definition algorithm. So they are not paying as much for that high movement as your other skinks are paying, um, and because of that, they suddenly become very good value. You do need to bring Kixie Tack and the Diviner, but Kixie Tack is not bad. He's got a triple, which is plus one move and plus one toughness for all of your friends within seven inches. So that's pretty good. Kixie Tack's ranged attack is also pretty decent, two, three, three, six. Again, very much like Pog, you can put the Divine Blessing of Strength onto Kixie Tacker, boost that to strength four. You're not gonna be winning on threes most of the time, but a three, six damage profile winning on fours Get, getting to shoot twice is actually pretty good. You can combo that with things like the Fight for Profit character, get a few more attacks in there, and suddenly Kixie Tack is doing quite a bit of damage. It's got 18 wounds, which is also pretty good. Movement 6, toughness 3, fantastic. The three skinks you're generally going to be taking most of the time are Otapattle, Top, and possibly Huachi. I generally don't tend to take Huachi. I usually take just Otapattle, Top, and Kixie Taka. These two skinks are fantastic. They all have 10 wounds, which is great. They all have much better ranged attacks than your normal skinks. Otapattle, 2, 3, 1, 5. So you'll be able to go crit fishing much more effectively than with your basic skinks and your Huanchi's claws. Again, you can combo these with Fight for Profit to get a lot more attacks in there and really push up your damage. Tok is kind of fine, 12 inch range, much better than your normal claws, only 8 inch range. But apart from that, they have the same damage profile, 2, 3, 1, 4. So for that extra 5 points, you are trading in some of the abilities of your Huanchi's claw for a much longer range. Uh, the same attack but on top of that the ability to have a melee attack so you'll be able to actually fight in combat if you need to um these skinks all have the seraphon reaction and uh, the seraphon reaction you're going to use before your opponent attacks you and they'll be reducing up to two crits from that attack action into hits this again really allows these skinks to survive for a lot longer than they would do normally. Something like a 2-4 damage profile effectively goes down to a 2-2 and it becomes very difficult to kill them in one shot. They do all have a double where they get to make a free disengage move if they're in combat, which again allows them to get in and around places. And Otapattle has a free move if he is not within 12 inches of a visible enemy fighter. So the three of these make a very flexible core for your warband that you can kind of build around, bring more Huanchi's claw, bring one of those support characters we were talking about, and really push your warband into those objective missions and into those treasure missions to make them much better at effectively two thirds of the game. So what kind of lists are we going to bring? I said that I did the legwork for you guys, so you don't have to go through the lengthy one-year process it took me to come up with these. But these are basically the best lists that you can bring for Hunters of Huanchi. If you're playing a one-box warband, what I would suggest to you is basically build all clubs on all your skinks, build blowpipes on your hornblowers, and build clubs on your leader and try and get as many Huanchi's claws converted as you can. That's basically if you're going to be building a one box warband. If you're not though, and you're thinking about taking these guys to events or playing with a much more competitive idea in mind, this is kind of what your lists are going to look like. So the first one, winning objective missions, we've got the Skin Calf and the Moonstone Club, which we've talked about. It's got that triple, can do a lot of work with that. We're going to be taking Kixie Tack of the Diviner, Otter Paddle and Top that we've already talked about in Bladeborne. We're going to be taking the Aether Chemist as our ally. And then Six Wanchi's Claws. This is a very large warband. If we're talking about something like the Games Workshop Rumble Pack, 
this is the kind of warband that you want to bring. The claws can kind of keep out the way. Otapatl can get to where he needs to get to. Kixi Tacker and Tok provide support. And then the Aether Chemist, he will sit on an objective, pop his fight for profit triple, and really allow your claws to turn into effectively a mobile gun line, allowing them to shoot down anything that you need to. The second version is kind of a sidestep from this list. If you want to make your Huanchi's Claw a lot more difficult to kill, what you can do is you can use Divine Blessings. Um, it's a very similar list. So we've got the Alpha, we've got Kixi Taka, Otapatl, Tok. Uh, we have the Aether Chemist. This time we're going to give him the Blessing of Might on his gun. So the gun is going to go up to 6513. And then we drop one Huanchi's Claw to give everything the Blessing of Fortitude. 14 wound Huanchi's Claw are way more difficult to kill than 10 wound Huanchi's Claw. It effectively gives them an entire additional attack action worth of longevity. And that allows you to move around the board easier. It means you're going to have more claws around at the end of the game to take objectives. It means that claws will be more difficult to kill from enemy shooting, enemy sniping. And if they have treasure, they're trying to run around. So yeah, I think... One of these two warbands is really what you're going to be looking at. Taking this further, what do we got? This, I believe, if you wanted to go down the damage route and let the maneuverability of the rest of your warband shine, I think this is where we want to go. This is my most up-to-date Hunters of Huanchi list. I think it's really, really good. We got Pock in there with the Divine Blessing to give it might, so plus one strength on its ranged attacks, turns it into a 2536. The explosive bolts double will allow it to take down chaff units and multiple chaff units. We also have Kalthia Zandaya here, so Kalthia Zandaya is mainly going to be using her triple to tell Pock to shoot again, so Pock gets to shoot three times in this case, and any remaining fighters that she's going to be able to affect, we get them to move around and we can get them to shoot also. I've talked about Pock's explosive shots doing horde clearing already. It plays very much like the new Wilder Corpse Hunters with the Arbalester. The Arbalester has a very similar ability to Pock, but with a lot more speed. One of the problems that I encountered when playing with Wilder Corpse, and I've played in a couple of events now with them, is that Slippery as a reaction is good and all, but if you're only at movement four, it really restricts your ability to get in and around enemy fighters and to move around the battlefield. So having movement six on all your guys, I think is a great trade-off to make. And yeah, that's why I've kind of gone back to Hunters of Wanchi for this one. Uh, you do have 35 points remaining for your Divine Blessings. There are a bunch of different things that you could do with this. You could put plus four wounds on two of those claws, make those claws 14 wounds a lot harder to kill. I feel like that's a bit too much mental load for me remembering which which skinks specifically have those blessings when i'm running five of them so my other alternative is to go either strength attack or plus one damage on kalthia overall the numbers indicate that going plus one base damage making her a five four three four is the way to go so that's what i've done and she's pretty good between kalthia and pock you actually have the ability to do damage to your opponent and on top of that, you get all of the bonuses that you get out of playing normal Hunters of Wanchi. You've got very good disruption triples that you can use, and you've got a lot of speed. You can get up onto those Nullwood platforms very easily using your doubles. You can boost your damage. You've got a lot of movement tricks. And yeah, that's why I, I love playing this Warband. And yeah, I think this is... If, if you're really into this kind of fight and fade, plink your opponents away from range, objective grabbing, treasure grabbing, kind of dancing around playstyle, uh, I think this is where you want to go. Okay, that's it from me for today. Thank you very much for watching this updated Hunters of Huan Chi video. I hope it's going to be something that's going to be useful for you in your games going forward. I, I think a lot of people have been put off by Hunters of Huan Chi just by looking at the stat line and saying, oh, these guys are garbage. So I can't play with them. I know that there's a big portion of people that do like to play effectively with one box warbands. When you're doing that, I think the Hunters are one of the weaker warbands on the scale. But if you're willing to put in relatively little time, you can convert up those extra Hunchy's claws. Or if you're in friendly games, just inform your opponent they're going to be claws and kind of leave it at that. And suddenly they become a lot better. Bringing in those allies really does help shore up those weaknesses. And it's a very rewarding playstyle for a someone who wants to play like that and someone who's willing to put in the time to really figure out what makes the army tick.
But yeah, anyway, that's it. That's it from me for today. Thank you very much for watching. As always, if you like what you see, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And let me know, let me know down in the comment section below what you think about what I put forward for you today. If you've got any interesting Hunts of Quanchi builds or you've got any interesting allies that you take, I'm always happy to see them. Or despite what I've said, if you think they are still garbage, that's also something that I'd like to hear. I've been Itan, this has been Off Better Musings, and I will see you next time.